And now, your accessories for your 1960s Studebaker Lark! Ribbed for your motoring pleasure! Try the transistor-powered manual tuning radio! Exceptional power, tone, and performance to make your radio listening pleasure! Tune in to find out where to find like-minded individuals! Exhaust deflector! A handsome component in stainless steel! Designed to do jack shit! Locking gas cap! Positive protection against gas tampering and theft! Strong lock with two keys to keep Manny Williams' kid from making whoopee with your filler neck! We interrupt these advertisements to remind you that the giveaway for the Viper Truck ends this Wednesday! Click the link in the description, whynotyougear.com! Buy a mug or digital download and get entered to win this Dodge Ram SRT 10. So click the link in the description. Why not you gear.com. Thank you. Chrome wheel discs, an exclusive eye appealing style for pretending to be tenured. Stainless spoked wheel discs, same subterfuge, but spend more you broke ragamuffin! Lark Mirror! For looking for friends of Dorothy! Stratoline Mirror! Same mirror, but now with more bullshit! Child Guard Rear Door Safety Locks! Having a baby won't solve your problems, make your mother respect you, or even let you be happy! Your child isn't a miracle. See a therapist. Automatic windshield washer filled with cum. Globe spinning power batteries. I'm gay. Please excuse the interruption. Your attention, please. In accordance with the Ministry of Internet Practices, we remind the audience and algorithm that Mr. Regular is a gay man and is authorized to make PG and PG-13 gay jokes. Thank you for your attention. A 200-sheet Kleenex dispenser for busting on the go! Studebaker Lark! Why not? Your wife is already used to a compact size. What's that? Watch my mouth! Why don't you make me Luster Seal Beauty Treatment? Luster Seal is cum cooling system. Maintain cooling system efficiency the SP way. And I'm gay. Our wives don't care what we do as long as they get their morphine. Here's a pony for you. I'm going boating. Studebaker Lark. Available in sedan for carrying you to pleasures of the flesh. Cushion toppers. Here's smooth cooling comfort for gay sex. Clear plastic seat covers, and I'm Robert L. Gay! Sun visor kits, I'm Bob Stevens, and I suck dick for free! Here's a lark, posting in front of airplanes you can't afford! A lark is an economy car, and that is a twin-engine Beechcraft twin bonanza. That is serious. I can't do the voice anymore. Yeah, even in the 60s, they were throwing this at you. Yeah, that Beechcraft twin's bonanza. It's it's total money. Even today, you come to a fly-in and a friggin' Beechcraft twin bonanza, people are like, oh. And a Subaru Lark, Subaru, what am I talking? Studebaker Lark, this was an economy car of the 1960s. I mean, the writings are, are, are on the wall for Studebaker. And they were, this is, a, the most important thing you need to know about the Studebaker uh, Lark is that it's a warmed over 1953 design in 1960, and they kept making it throughout the 60s. This was one of the cheapest cars in America. Granted, Ford was able to undercut even Studebaker with their Falcon, 
But if you bought a Studebaker Lark, you didn't have money or you were you were not the type of person to roll around in the, the Beechcraft Twin Bonanza. Those and each engine is like 500 cubic inches. And here you are in your Lark trying to pretend you no, no. Maybe you could own a share of a Piper Cub. Maybe. If you owned a Beechcraft Twin Bonanza at any point in history, you're driving Cadillacs. Studebaker Lark. The official car of the nuclear family. You have a dad who learned the value of pretending to like his job, and a wife who learned the value of pretending to like her husband, and a child too naive to know the difference. But it's the early 60s, and this is what counts as family. And in 30, 40, 50, 60 years, everybody's going to be talking about how badly they wanted to go back to this era because, oh, music was music, and everybody talked to each other instead of looking at their phones. Oh, I'll bet you were the summit of thought-provoking discussion with such topics as, what do you think this mole means, and how many cans of beans should I put in my fallout shelter? Studebaker Lark, the shining chariot for the family that owns three or more bags of flour. Oh, boy. Dad is home. And Barb, an older sports ball throwing brother, he has a letter on his jacket and a chip on his shoulder. And he better get those dukes up because dad's been throwing back bellions and he's about as unintelligible as Charlie Brown's teacher. Produced from 1959 to 1966, the Lark was one of the last ditch efforts to save Studebaker Packard from going under. By abandoning the design philosophy of the full-size cars of the mid-50s in favor of compact economy approaches. It goes back to the early 50s when Packard was getting its clock clean by Buick and Cadillac and needing to increase volume to keep pace. Packard's president, James Nance, was looking to merge with Studebaker to make use of their ability to fulfill high-volume orders and their far-reaching dealer network. It also didn't hurt that they had a generally more affordable identity, with easier inroads to wider market demographics. But even then, Studebaker was the secondary choice, since the plan of the previous regime had been focused on Nash Motors, whose president had been trying to get all the independent automakers into one big company to combat the big three. The hope was for Nash, Studebaker, Hudson, and Packard to merge. But when Nance took over from the previous president, the deal fell through. Nash and Hudson formed AMC, and the Packard board got scared by early financials indicating the newly formed company would end the year in debt. So Packard went after Studebaker, and the deal was made official on October 1, 1954. Less than two weeks later, AMC President George Mason died, and Vice President George Romney took over. Nance and Romney didn't see eye to eye, so any chance of Packard Studebaker eventually joining AMC fell through leaving Packard with Studebaker in a newlywed phase that died quicker than Google Glass. You see, Packard never did an independent audit of Studebaker before merging, and so they ended up getting a rude awakening when it came out that Studebaker actually was way worse off than it initially seemed. By this point, it was too late to back out, since Packard couldn't afford to go it alone. So they went all in on Studebaker, with some additional help from the Curtis Wright Aircraft Company, who offered them tens of millions for access to their production facilities and remaining defense contracts, along with a management that would give Curtis Wright stock options with the company. Nance didn't want to have to take that deal, but it was to the point that Studebaker Packard was their only way out, and only being kept alive by their credit lines. The minute the board agreed to the deal in July 1956, Nance bailed for Ford, and the company was left in freefall kept afloat by the Curtis Wright money and a deal to distribute Mercedes-Benz's stateside. The one upside in all of this was that the new president of Curtis Wright, a man by the name of Harold Churchill, was the guy who offered the idea of getting out of the full-size car market and into compact cars in the first place. Which is how we ended up with the Lark. Because if compact economy cars could work for AMC with the Rambler, it could work for Studebaker too. So they just chopped down the sedan platform they were using since 1953, shortened the wheelbase and overhangs for reduction in length of up to 28 inches, 
but with a full-size cabin worthy of a Ford or a Plymouth. With 30,000 initial orders upon release in November 1958, the Lark was already on track with helping Studebaker break even for the first time since merging with Packard. By 1959, the company-wide volume increased to 160,826 cars and 10,909 trucks, with Studebaker-Packard making a $28.5 million profit for the year. This money, combined with their Daimler-Benz deal, allowed them to break free of Curtis Wright. Sales continued to sit in the six-figure range for 1960, but by 1961, the bill came due. Suddenly, they were struggling to get above 65,000 larks due to competition from the likes of Ford with their Falcon and Chevy with their Corvair. For a few short years, it seemed like Studebaker might actually make it. Lord knows they fought like hell. But the Lark wasn't improving the long-term viability of the company. It was like using a phoenix down on a pile of ashes. Look, Studebaker meant well. But you know who else means well? Anybody who wears a condom hoping not to give their partner the clap. Like, you tried to mitigate things, but you still knew what you had. And you took the risk anyway. Just bust in two minutes and bounce. Studebaker tried here, like a husband who gave fatherhood a whirl and then bailed after his third sleepless week. His family never saw him again, and there's probably an unsolved crime somewhere waiting for his DNA to enter the system. Oh, that's just old Randy. Don't mind him. He got kicked in the head by a donkey and now he don't get hard no more. The Lark 6 indicated the flathead six-cylinder. But this doesn't have the Studebaker 6 anymore. This has a Chevy 350. Where did it come from? I think a C20 truck. Whatever. From factory, the Chevy V8. There are so many numbers to talk about Chevy small blocks, SSB everywhere. It's probably making 155 to 165 horsepower. So this is a Studebaker with a Malays era engine. But it's more than the original Studebaker flathead 6 which got about 90 horsepower at 4,000 RPM and 145 pound-feet of torque at 200 RPM. Studebaker offered a stronger eight-cylinder option from the factory, which offered 180 horsepower and 260 pound-feet of torque. Not too bad, but again, it's like using a first-aid kit on a limb that's already been amputated. We gotta start breaking now, don't we? Politics is my hobby. Yeah, that's like... Is that me or him? I actually don't know. Probably us. Oh, hard on the brake, hard on the brake, hard on the brake, hard on the brake, hard on the brake. If it had its original transmission, it would have been a conventional three speed auto with an optional overdrive or the Flight Omatic, which I believe was developed with Borg Warner because this area was obsessed with blank Omatic names. But this is currently running a Chevy TH350. The last inspection occurred at 27,000 miles in 1986. Alden got this car for $1,500 because the seller wanted it gone so badly. This car was originally owned by an excommunicated Amish guy from Lancaster, and it was completely undrivable upon purchase because the brake shoes were reversed for some reason. There was also a gas tank leak and the fuel sender unit pretty much didn't work. This was a real stripper car. No tack, no radio, no seatbelts. Like, I, you know, I want a car with nothing. For the type of guy who goes to a diner and asks for dry toast and water. If you knew what was coming, you'd be eating like this too. See, the only thing that was changed on this car was the engine and transmission. That's it. Stock brakes, even though they work. Stock wheels. Recreation tires. I think they're steel belted radials, at least at this point. But now it's breathing through a four barrel. Yes, it'll go on the highway. Yes, it'll go 70. Alden says the weird thing about driving like a car from the early 60s is that people think you're slow, so you go, go slow. But there's another thing going on here because this is really a design from 53, even though it's sold in 60. My Falcon didn't have the problem of people trying to pass me all the time, but Alden, everybody tries to pass him all the time, even when he's going 70. Because it's like, oh, it's an old car. He's not going very fast and he won't be able to get up this hill. And obviously he does go up the hill. But that was another thing going on with Studebaker. They couldn't afford to redesign their cars for the modern sort of jet age. 
And that makes me think that, okay, Studebakers in 1960s were for old men who uh, longed for the quaintness of the 30s and the depression. But that really wasn't the case. I was call- talking to my friend Jim Shulman who says, no, 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 Studebaker was the American sob. These were for weirdos. The Studebaker Lark was for the conscientious objector from World War II. The people who bought Studebaker Lark handed out flyers, but they were also successful enough to own a new car, so they were the one earner in a house full of beets. Uh, Comparing this to a Tata Nano wouldn't be too far off the mark for how minimalist it is. It has wheels and an engine. It goes forward and backward. It has seats and doors to access those seats. They tried to make it look luxurious, but Studebaker often fell short of that mark. But one thing it does that stands out to me above all others is the taillights. So what's so great about the taillights? You can see them from the side of the car. That was something American cars really didn't start doing until the 80s. Yes, I suppose with tail fins, you can see the turn signals from the side. But this is 1960, and you can see where the car is turning for 180 degrees behind the car. Almost entirely stock, except for the engine and transmission. The engine and transmission are out of a 1980 Chevy C20 pickup truck from like the Malaise era, so it doesn't make a lot of horsepower, but it is a V8 in a smaller car. Um, but it is still running this, you know, the manual drum brakes. It's still running uh, you know, manual steering. It's still doing everything that it did, you know, 60 years ago. It's just, it has a V8 now, which it isn't too crazy for these cars because these cars did come equipped with a V8, um, but it was like 180 horsepower, which is about probably what this makes, if not a little less. But, you know, it's it's set up for a six cylinder and it has an eight cylinder in it. So, I mean, but I'm sure it's, you know, a couple hundred pounds heavier. So if you look in the front, those tires are actually inflated more than what they're supposed to be. Not, not the max PSI, but like they're like 33 or 30, 34 PSI and they are, you know, they're bulging a little bit. Basically a regular consumer back in 1960 is like, why would I buy a Studebaker? I can buy a Ford, you know, Ford Falcon. Why would I do it? So it just kind of killed the hype of these cars and then it just drastically shot off after this year with the big three coming out with more and more options so with the steering the way the steering is set up from when the engine was put in the way Studebaker made their steering it has like these bars that go over for the steering linkage and it hits the headers and so you know I've gotten it to be much better than what it is right now or like what it was before but it's it still hits the exhaust when you turn and like with the body roll when you turn it makes it a little bit harder to turn I rebuilt the carburetor since I've had it. I put a new accelerator pump and did everything, all the gaskets and everything. I changed uh, the headlights with new old stock headlights that were brand new in the box um, that say Studebaker on them. There's a really cool company uh, called Studebaker International and they provide everything for these cars, which is surprising. That was one of my hesitations with buying this car was buying a, a, a dead brand for over 50 years. Like it's been, it, they went off the market in 64. And so I think they stopped car production in Canada in 66. So it's been dead since 66. So I'm like, where am I gonna find parts for a Studebaker? Especially a Lark. It's not like it's a crazy, you know, like a, a Golden Hawk or an Avanti. Um, but surprisingly, there is a ton of parts for these things. Some old stock, you know, new old stock that they haven't remanufactured, but a lot of stuff they have. It's like I got a new door striker bushing in my door and that's brand new like they 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 man they manufacture it so you can own you know an orphan brand car like a, a kaiser fraser or something or something outlandish and then you know if something tiny breaks that could be what parks your car for months until you find a new old stock part or some guy that has it you know in rural pa you go into a garage and he you know he has a box full of them to have an aftermarket that you can just order and have in a week is that's the key to owning old cars, I think, honestly. People, I get it all the time. People are like, is that car like British? I've even gotten, is it like an old Soviet car? Like, is it a gas? Like I've gotten all of it. And I'm like, no, it's as American as it possibly can be. It's from South Bend, Indiana. It was manufactured in the US. This is America. And people, because of the way it looks, because it's from the early 60s, late, you know, late 50s, early 60s, and it doesn't have fins. It's not flashy. Yeah, it has chrome, but like it's it's all black. Like it, it's, it's, doesn't it looks foreign and that 
alone makes it weird and I, I love weird things I love weird cars and so to have a car not to be like fool myself but like to have a car and you show up in a car show and you're the only one there is kind of a cool feeling it really is when you're the 10th tri-5 Chevy that shows up it's like okay but what have you done to your car with this it's like it doesn't matter what you've done to your car it is the car this is the car so I think that alone is something that just keeps drawing me to the car. I, initially, I was like, I don't really want this car. It's not really me. But now that I'm you know, driving it more and more, I'm finding out that it, it is me. <laughs> it really is me.